Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I am so glad to see and hear all of you today. We have a terrific guest with a really important subject, and I'm looking forward to diving in. But before we do that, let me introduce everybody uh, to the forum. Let me explain where it came from, who supports it, how it works, and then we'll introduce our guest. So, please, Tara, over to the next slide. So, the Future Trends Forum is a discussion-based program. Here we converse about the future of education and technology. Our focus is on conversation and discussion. And this spins out of the Future Trends in Technology Education Report. And that's the FTTE report, which is a monthly trends analysis. If you haven't seen that, go to FTTE.us. You can download a few sample issues and subscribe if you like. But the key thing there is to take a look at the major trends that are reshaping education and technology. What we do here on the forum is we discuss them. And we have a free range of conversation. Everyone is invited to comment, push back, show examples, and above all, ask questions. Next slide, please. Now, the forum and the FTT report are both part of a larger project called the Future of Education Observatory. And this is a multimedia, ongoing, open, participatory exploration of where higher education is going. So it includes the FTT report, it includes this forum, it also includes a blog, it includes a bunch of other writing, it also has a book club and even a bookstore. So if you haven't seen that, let's go to futureofeducation.us, you can find that more. Now, that's the project, that's where all this came from. Now, let me explain what supports it and how it works. So the next slide, please. So one of our great sponsors is NyserNet from New York State. This is a nonprofit that works to get that state's colleges and universities on broadband internet. They do terrific work. They both have a great community, and we're really grateful to them for their generous sponsorship. We're also grateful to Shindig, because as you can tell, Shindig makes available this technology that we're using right now. So let me just take a minute and walk you through it. Again, the key thing here is conversation. Now, where I am and where the slide is, just for a minute, it's called the stage. And it's called that because everybody here in this video conference can see and hear what we're saying, what we're doing. And you can join us. I'll show you how to do that. Now, below us, if you scan around, you can see what I think of as the audience or the participant swarm. You can see person after person, icon after icon. You can see Roxanne Riskin smiling at us. You can see a silhouette for Glady Stroop and so on. And all of that, you'll see the people move around a little bit. Their icons will shift back and forth, kind of like people in an audience. And if you want to talk to one of those people on a one-to-one -one basis, simply double-click on their icon. And if they want to talk to you and their camera or microphone working, your two icons will click together like Legos. And you'll have your own private audiovisual bubble. Now, if you want to converse with myself and with the guest and everybody else, there are three major ways of doing that. Look down at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a white strip running along. There are three options there. On the leftmost edge, you'll see a number. I think right now it's 82 and a bunch of little heads and a kind of box there. If you click on that, up will pop two boxes. The one on the left is a kind of film strip view of all participants. So you can just mouse over it right now and find out more about different people. You can see that uh, uh, Danny Shepard is an associate professor of psychology, University of Alaska Fairbanks, that Heidi Cates is an electronic resources librarian at CSEC and so on. On the right side, is a chat box, and there you can type and chat with a roughly 19 or so people who have logged in nearest to you. So right now I can see Nancy Wiener, Sarah Kunza, Roxanne Riskin, Danny Dilks, Vanessa Vale, um, Sierra Adari, Taurus Wupa, Alan Heaps, and so on. And the chat box is good for having informal conversations. I find people also like to share uh, anything that's covered in the course of the conversation. So if today's guest mentions an article or a website that sounds really appealing, then people will often paste in a URL or some comments there. Now go back to that white strip. Next to the chat box and the number, you'll see a question mark with the word ask on it if you highlight it. Now that gives you a little chat box that lets you type in a question or a comment. And if you do that, we can flash it on the screen so everyone will see it, and I'll read it out loud so everyone can hear it. So that's another way to ask a question that everyone can see. Now, best of all, if your microphone is working, and your camera is working, and you're in a place like I am right now where you can speak out loud, click that raised hand icon. That tells us you want to join us on stage. So if you click the icon, we'll ping you, make sure it works, and the time is right, we'll beam you up on stage, and you can join us. In fact, we can have up to four people here at once, so we could have our guest, we could have myself, and two of you at the same time, a kind of ad hoc pop-up DIY video panel. 
And we do this all the time. So if you haven't turned on your camera, um, give it a try. This is really easy to do. So video, text, chat, those are three great ways to participate. Uh, and all of them work. And I want to encourage you for the next hour to participate. All of your contributions are valued. We really respect everybody's opinions. And if this isn't enough for your conversational interests, if you really want to make sure that you uh, have another tool to use, go to Twitter and use the hashtag FTTE. And we'll be monitoring that during this conversation for any other comments or questions. So those are multiple ways of participating. What I'm doing now, yelling at you and showing you slides, it's going to stop in just a second. But I want to be sure to thank Shinde for making this technology available. And I also want to thank one more excellent population, and that's our supporters on Patreon. And if you haven't seen that, Patreon is a crowdfunding site which lets you support someone doing some innovative work. So if you go to Brian, if you go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, you can see multiple ways to support the work that I'm doing. And you can see here this list of folks here, people like Jimmy Kim Hong, Paul McConaughey, Kyle Johnson, Bob Johnson, Corey S. Yes, Chris Lott, all kinds of great people uh, contributed enough to get their names on the wall of credits that I show wherever I go. Uh, we're really grateful to our Patreons uh, for their support, and we hope you can join them. So that's how the future transform is supported. That's how it came to be. That's how the technology works. Let's cut to the chase right now, and let me introduce you to this week's wonderful guest. Uh, professor Miller is a professor of psychological sciences, and she's also President's Distinguished Teaching Fellow at Northern Arizona University. She's the author of a new book that applies learning science to teaching online called Minds Online, Teaching Effectively with Technology. And everyone knows who has been involved in the forum at all that teaching online has been a major, major topic for us. So we're really, really keen to hear Dr. Miller's insights into how to apply the science of learning to the practice of teaching online. So Tara, why don't you bring down the slide and bring up our guest, please. Welcome, Professor Miller. Hi, everyone. Hi, thank you, Brian, and, and thanks to everybody who took the time to join us today. This is a, I, I'm so pleased to be a part of this community today. Well, you're very kind and you're very, very welcome. Uh, let me ask the first question is, where are you today? Sure. Well, I'm in my uh, campus office at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, Arizona. So um, don't think, you know, cactus and flip flops, think uh, snow and uh, volcanic peaks. So if you've ever been up to the Grand Canyon, wow. and I, I hope you have, or, and I hope you will, um, then you've probably been through Flagstaff, Arizona, since we are um, really, we're, we're a very vibrant, uh, very compact community, but um, we're the last stop uh, on the way out to the Grand Canyon, surrounded by a lot of wide open space. Wow, that's fantastic. So it's probably a little Thanks. warm there today is my guess. Uh, for us, it is a little warm, meaning it's in the upper 70s. <laughs> okay, that'll work, that'll work. And before yeah. we go further, Michelle, why, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us what you do um, at Northern Arizona and tell us what you're researching. Okay, so, you know, I started out in my career as a cognitive psychologist, and probably a lot of you might be familiar with that subdiscipline, but if you're not, it's, it's an area of psychology that has to do with um, uh, processes such as memory and language, uh, thought processes, working memory and attention and so forth. It crosses over a lot of times into neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience, but uh, you know, those fields complement each other a great deal. So that's where I started out, you know, working in um, some kind of, now they seem awfully arcane to me, some of these research interests in, uh, I looked at working memory, I looked at how uh, memory changed over the lifespan, I used to study cognitive aging in graduate school, and a lot of things like that, mm -hmm. but... Um, now, then I came to work here where, you know, teaching is really prized at my institution. And I started uh, interacting with other colleagues who were passionate about teaching. And, you know, this educational technology started to come on the scene. And we started to ask, well, could we use the tools of our discipline to really investigate um, these, at the time, uh, new modalities for learning? and look at not just effectiveness, but also kind of what goes on in the mind and so forth. And so that's what led me to the experience of writing Minds Online. Um, that in itself grew out of, if anything, some work I put together for my graduate students years ago. I was looking into 
you know, what they were learning about memory in their education textbooks and online. And I was just going, oh my gosh, that's out of date or that's not right. And so I wrote up um, some points about memory that I thought all budding teachers should know about. And I ended up turning that into a small article and, you know, published it, didn't think anybody would read it. Well, James Lang from the Chronicle of Higher Education read it and he liked it. And, you know, one thing led to another and that led to, um, you know, as I talked about ways to develop this for a broader audience, it came up that in particular technology, um, educational technology, which I had been writing about as well, could really uh, tie into this framework that we had developed from cognitive psychology. So in no way am I the first person who ever said, let's take cognitive psychology and apply that to learning techniques. But I think what I've been able to do is really talk to faculty about, you know, what their questions are, what their, uh, for lack of a better word, barriers and problems are, and find ways to advance that and open up some new conversations. So that's um, that's been the wonderful experience of, of Minds Online, and it's led me to, to uh, folks like this today. Well, fantastic. What a good story. And uh, thank you for doing Thanks. this important work. Uh, the science of learning is vital. And we have all kinds of questions. And friends, again, please uh, use okay. either any, any of those buttons on the white strip to put your questions forward. And uh, again, don't be shy about video, which will work very, very easily. Um, and we have a bunch of questions that have already come in, partly on Twitter and partly on Slack. <laughs> Um, so one question that's come in is from uh, Ed Webb oh. at Dickinson College, and he asks, what do we really understand at this point about multitasking and distraction? Oh my gosh, Ed, you know, what a great, what a great topic, and that is um, actually where uh, a lot of my kind of post Minds Online interest led me because, you know, like you, mm. this is what, I mean, faculty have questions about this, and we actually saw last year this crazy spate of dueling op-eds and blog posts and all these things. And, and I will say my own thinking has evolved about this. So, you know, you've got a theoretical question, but of course we've got the practical issue in the background of like, okay, we all know we don't want distracted students and uh, we battle this ourselves most likely. So what do we really understand? Now, the cocktail party thing, the thing that people like to like relate to me at cocktail parties as solemn fact is the brain can't multitask. Well, I, you know, I can't help it. I have to look at that and say, well, technically, uh, you can breathe at the same time as you're walking around. Your brain is a big parallel processing um, machine. And even as you decode sentences, I mean, we know from language research, you know, part of your brain is figuring out the syntax and part of your brain is kind of looking and saying, ooh, what's the subtext here and the emotions? Your brain is is doing that. And, you know, classic working memory research, too, shows that it's the kind of multitasking you're doing. So, for example, if you're working out a spatial issue in your head, if you're thinking about, oh, what's the best, uh, quickest way to go to the Grand Canyon today, and you're doing a visual spatial task at the same time, you're going to get all kinds of interference. But you might be able to, uh, say, do a visual spatial task, like I might be able to knit and then have a conversation that's using very different capacity. So those are the, the caveats from the research. That said, we also know that people do tend to radically overestimate um, and, you know, under notice when we are multitasking and, um, and we miss something. So we aren't very good at knowing what we don't know. We aren't very good at noticing what we aren't noticing. Um, that's a sort of a, a basic thing. And the work of Dan Simons, which um, a lot of people are familiar with now, there are a lot of his um, famous count the basketball passes video. If you've seen that, I'm not going to spoil it. Oh, but, yes. You know, yes, that, yes. that work has really illustrated that as well. His work has also illustrated that we think we can do things like learn by osmosis. We think we can kind of pick things up passively. And uh, there's a longstanding kind of conclusion from cognitive research that, that we don't do that very well. So I think that that's where we're, we're at right now. Um, you know, that said, I, even though we have this research that says, you know, multitasking and being distracted is um, really a big barrier to learning. It's, it's, it's anathema to learning. We know that. Um, 
I've kind of come around in terms of, well, are things like banning laptops and kind of, you know, put down that smartphone, it's right in your brain, kid. I've I've come around Mm -hmm. to think that that's maybe not the best approach for various reasons. So there's a lot to still consider, but it's definitely something that all of us, especially if we're into learning, human development of any kind, you got to think of the world. I think of the world. Oh, oh, to think about distraction and how we can best use our attentional resources because they are limited and they are more limited than we may realize in the moment. Well, thank you. That's a that's a rich, rich answer. I really appreciate that. Is, <laughs> is it, would would it be question. true to say that the, the, that the science on this is still in early days or is the science more or less mature? Hmm. You know, I think the science is is fairly mature we have uh, we we know a lot we're really kind of coming off uh close to a couple decades of just an explosion of really um high level high quality research theoretical research into how attentional system works the attentional system works in the mind in the brain we have a pretty understanding of a lot a lot of issues um I think that where the research needs to go is like in, in inter, you know, what interventions um, can work. Uh, what really are, I think what maybe is up in the air is I know there's a lot of questions about, say, the long term, even um, neural impacts mm. of using technology. Mm. I tend to be a bit of a skeptic about that. I think that that's, mm. that's another thing that, you know, it's easy to relay that at a cocktail party that, oh, science has found that using a smartphone changes your brain well everything changes your brain this webinar is changing your brain hopefully um you know so uh, that's that's an oversimplification but there you know i i i will i will i will grant that we do uh, uh, gaming is another very similar issue you know what are the impacts on the brain positive negative or neutral of um heavy long-term gaming and there's research going on but i think that we can look at that um as well uh but yeah i think faculty now we have to look at this and say i got to make up my own mind on how i'm going to approach this and um Mm. how i how i'm going to manage that and talk to my students about it so that's kind of my take on it right now especially talking to students thank you that's excellent Mm. um before i have questions uh, we have a video request from uh Oh, uh, Vasudeva, let's uh, let's bring Vasudeva Rao Aravinda. And Vasudeva, if I massacred your name, please forgive me. Uh, let's yeah. see if we've gone. Hello, yeah, Vasudeva. Did I think did I destroy your name? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, you can call me Vasu. V A. That's the first four letters. Vasu. That'll work. Okay. Well, welcome, yeah. welcome, Vasu. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, so my question is, I'm, uh, I try to follow research from two different sides. So on the one side, we have research, uh, a whole a big deal of research being done in the learning sciences, cognitive sciences. And uh, on the other hand, we have research in uh, education, such as physics education, science education, and so on. Uh, so from what I have seen so far, I sense that there is some kind of a, a disconnect between the research along the two sides, even though there are some people borrow results from uh, learning sciences and implemented in physics education largely i see there is a gap between uh, learning science the research in learning sciences and uh, research in physics education uh, why do you think that is and what can we do to bridge the gap hmm. wow okay yeah, you know okay. it may be a kind yeah, of a classic okay maybe a kind of a classic uh, glass half full glass half empty um you know i I kind of look at this as well as somebody who's been in this for longer than I can even (laughs) admit. Um, You know, when I started teaching, people were saying, why should we have any science? I mean, how does this evidence-based stuff, how does psychology research, you know, teachings, uh, it's, it's an intangible, it's an art, it's not a science. And now I'll go to a conference and people who are in philosophy and English, they'll raise their hand and say, okay, I want to see, you know, show me the data. I want to see the confidence intervals. So I see a a real raising in consciousness across disciplines that at least that basic idea that uh, science and the science of the mind might have something to do with something. Uh, That's what I think you're right in it about. Wow. It does get spread out. And, you know, I, I, 
usually weasel out of saying, what even is learning science? I mean, we can kind of talk about some examples. I think cognitive psychology fits, but neuroscience to an extent fits as well. Um, and then there's education research. There's multi research on multimedia, which fits, but is that education? Is it cognitive psychology? Um, you know, I tend not to, not to try to engage in that. So, um, but yeah, then in the disciplines, we've got kind of a scholar, is it fair to say a scholarship of teaching and learning sort of approach yeah. of, okay, we tried this, here's what happened. We tried this thing, here's what happened. Yeah, it, and when you think about it, what a tremendous, um, possibly overly ambitious project it would be to try to bring all those all those together. So yeah, I maybe I'm too optimistic. I tend to see it when I, I notice it when I say, oh, wow, over here, here's a botany, you know, professor who picked up on some concepts like retrieval practice from cognitive psychology, and he's using them. That's great. But you're saying there's there's still a, a lot of disconnect and a, maybe a feeling that everybody's going in a lot of different directions. So I'll put it back over to you to expand. Uh, for example, you know, one thing that I could say is, uh, uh, you know, I build uh, intelligent tutoring systems for physics primarily because I teach physics. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there was yeah. recently, uh, not recently, maybe five years ago or 10 years ago, there was a huge intelligent tutoring system that was built by expert called the Andes tutoring system, uh, uh, which was built okay. by a professor from uh, Arizona and uh, Carnegie Mellon University, a collaborative effort. And uh, most of the results from there has been uh, published in uh, cognitive science and learning science related journals, but not in physics education, mm -hmm. even though the tutor was basically for physics. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mm -hmm. was. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. I, so you can. Yeah. Right. And then I, I'll be reading, you know, as I fall down all kinds of research rabbit holes, you know, I'll turn up these great, um, I think, very theoretically relevant articles and they're in a specialty journal and I'm going well gosh uh, people who are outside of botany uh, people who are outside of physics could really benefit from from this so wow why are we uh, this this sort of takes it off the radar now with the modern indexing systems and Twitter and the ways we have of exchanging this stuff like crazy um, that helps. It's not like it was a long time ago where I would never run across something outside of my discipline or it would be very unlikely. But, you know, that's, I, I think that maybe that's why unconsciously I've been attracted to trying to um, bring lots of examples when I talk about this stuff to faculty and I talk about this stuff to leadership. Um, I, I say, okay, let's talk about three examples of practice that draw on retrieval practice. Um, here's here's uh, two examples of interleaving another you know kind of theoretical principle from cognitive psychology and then pull from different disciplines um, one might be design and here's somebody's teaching art uh, here's somebody's teaching physics and maybe through that we can get people uh, really talking to each other because you know and to say look the common the common thread here is evidence-based practice and using technology in ways that tap into that and beyond that, yeah, the discipline is really important. You can't talk to faculty without kind of acknowledging their discipline. But yeah, there are some things that hold across there. So it's a fascinating question. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that to the surface. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. So more of interdisciplinary uh, conferences or yeah. meetings. Okay. Yeah. And this is, this is a good one. Here we are. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Let's try this. Ah, How there we go. Now? Ah, now we're back. There we go. Now we're back. Uh, can, is the sound okay, Michelle? Now it is, yes. Now it is, yes. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Uh, we have a text oh, question. I am getting uh, a little bit of I'm getting a little bit of feedback again. Feedback again. Okay, okay. Uh, well, let me switch headphones. Um, and uh, okay. in the meantime, we have a text question if we can flash it on the screen. Um, this is from, uh, let's see. This is uh, from Krista Morrison. Uh, what do we know about digital note taking in terms of retention, or is that not a goal? Uh, Tara, if you could bring it back up, please. Or is that not a goal of digital note taking? Uh, is it more about augmenting information or organizing information? Oh, good question. Yeah. So, and by that, I'm I, I'm kind of picturing, you know, a student with a laptop or a tablet. 
perhaps even a phone who's who's taking that instead of our classic you know I've got my lined notebook and my pen at the ready um, you know and this is almost an outgrowth of the the great laptop in class wars of, of 2017 um, you know yeah there's there's a really good respectable article out there by uh, Danny Oppenheimer and, and colleagues um, the pen is mightier than the laptop so it's got a very clickable title too mm -hmm. and yeah they they looked at retention and yeah that is something that we do tend to emphasize those of us from a cognitive perspective rightly or wrongly that's sort of our go-to not always but frequently if we're looking at effectiveness or learning we go with retention um so yeah where where do we come out on that too so I, i'm not disputing oppenheimer's um conclusions and, and it has been a while since i looked at the article so you know that got to qualify it with that too however i mean my Gut as a psychologist tells me that yeah it is a, it's nothing to do with the fact that it's paper um, it has it may it may not even have to do with slowing students down per se which is the other thing that happens when you take notes on paper um, and you know I, I just wish that we could we could look at and engage students in talking about you know how do we do um, how how do we do um, more integration more synthesis more intelligent note taking that's not merely transcription and and that's of course of course the issue um i am probably hopelessly personally biased on this as well um i blogged about this this last year one of the the few blog posts you know most of my blog posts are, are kind of more um they're, they're not as, as personal but this one was personal and it was talking about um the a real accessibility issue and the accommodation issue that happens if we just kind of say it's paper or it's nothing put the laptop away that is that some of us myself included have some real issues with hand transcription and you know yeah. oddly i don't think that we've also talked about you know the reason why i as a professional use digital note taking um, I'm not an Evernote, you know, uh, believe, believe, I, I think it's great, but I, I, I do a lot of very similar stuff to that. The reason why we do that is also searchability and indexing and tagging. You can't do that with a piece of paper. And I mean, props to my colleagues who've got their, you know, their wonderful Moleskine notebook and they always know where to find their stuff. I might go, I've got 20 different projects and things going on. I might circle back to a conference that I was at a year ago. I don't know how mm -hmm. people find that stuff. So oddly, I don't think we've kind of talked about that either is that, well, what can students do with, with digital note taking that they really can't do with paper? So with respect to those who've looked at it and found better retention, I say, you know, again, let's engage students in, in how to take better notes of all kinds across all different formats. And I would like to see more, more on the, the, affordances of digital note taking as well. So I think it may have gotten a little bit of a raw deal. So hopefully that, that addresses the question and feel free to follow up if not. Indeed, that's a great question. And Michelle, what a great answer. If, if I understand correctly, two, two themes uh -huh. have emerged from, from your remarks so far. Uh, one is the importance yeah. of faculty talking with students about these technologies and the practices. Mm -hmm. And the second is that there's no one size fits all. A lot of this really depends on the individual faculty member their curriculum i think so and yeah i yeah that's a great synthesis um and distillation of of two themes you're absolutely right and i hate to be you know on the one hand we don't want to be wishy-washy and just always say oh it depends on the situation because that's not useful advice for faculty i don't blame faculty at all for coming to say a development workshop and saying look I need to know what policy to put in my syllabus. I don't want to hear a lot of on the one hand, other hand. But yeah, realistically, we do have to, I think it's always useful to step back and say, what's, what's the big picture point here? Um, oftentimes people, you know, if I could just tangent for a second, as somebody who talks in this area, maybe you find this as well, Brian. Um, as somebody works in this area, I sometimes find that people try to push me into this corner of, well, Tell me how the brain processes PowerPoint and is it good or bad? Yeah, that. I, tell me how the brain learns when we take notes on a laptop. 
Um, I think I have to step back and say, well, what are you doing when you're using a laptop? What, what mentally, mm -hmm. what mental processing is going mm -hmm. on and what's not going on? And so I, I, I always try to step back from uh, the super simplification um, of those questions because it's uh, the brain doesn't know a thing about PowerPoint, but it, it, it processes verbal and, and visual information in certain ways that we can then talk about and use as a useful way to say, how can we use this better in learning and presentation? So, so yeah, but, and I saw the digital note taking thing kind of heading down that road in a few ways of just like, well, laptops do this to your mind. Yeah, right. it depends on how you use them. There's a, a wonderful historian named Kevin Gannon, uh, who often points oh, out yeah. it really depends on, on your pedagogy and what the pedagogical situation is, and it's, it can differ very greatly. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a quick uh, a quick observation from uh, Britt Watwood on Twitter, and he asks, Hi, uh, is, there a con is there a continuum from evidence-based teaching to science of teaching and learning to learning science? Wow, okay. I would say possibly, but boy, I I hope that uh, you know it would that would be a really great thing to put together um, that taxonomy or that spectrum and expand on that idea because we are definitely in this era where I don't think it's a bad thing necessarily. It's perhaps a reflection of how vibrant this field is and how many you know cool individuals are in this field right now that we have all these different terms and big umbrellas, little umbrellas. And I mean, you've got mind brain education and that's sort of related, but not the same exact thing. Um, uh, it'd be wonderful if we could five years from now have uh, a, a much more clear taxonomy of, of, of what those terms are. And I think partly what that might help us do is, for example, well, this is a very practical issue having to do with ed tech is that we're oftentimes, we have to evaluate what are sometimes commercial products from companies that want right. to sell us, here's right. this thing. And if this is another kind of mixed mixed feelings thing for me as a psychologist, I see these products that are pitched and they say, well, it's got learning science. And you go, that's right. awesome, where is that? Well, because we ask questions. Technically, that's not wrong, but um, it, it could be anything from like that to we we've implemented this really complex thing having to do with, you know, interleaving and spacing and retrieval practice and students are engaging in these rich ways. It, it could be that it could be we have three multiple choice questions at the end of each module. And who's right? I, if we had a better, you know, feeling for that, we could maybe um, push that ahead, that agenda ahead a little bit better. So. I say, Britt, keep keep thinking about that. That's 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 one to run with. That's a good idea. Well, thank you, Britt. Um, and uh, again, let me just remind everybody. Uh, Britt's question came uh, via Twitter. Uh, we have a bunch of questions coming by text, and um, we've also, if your camera works, turn it on so you can join us up here on stage. You see that we're pretty friendly. Uh, Tara, what's uh, what's the next question that's bubbled in so far? I think we have a text one. And this is from Ray Garcelon. Hello, Ray. Are there any still commonly used learning paradigms like Myers-Briggs, mm. Styles, that are not supported by more current learning research that you feel need to be redirected? Ooh, dark question, Ray. <laughs> it is, and so diplomatically put. I, <laughs> so... <laughs> That's truly, truly masterful. And, and I mean, in all seriousness, it is very easy to get into this... Uh, mo you know, mode of like, oh, people are believe all this bad stuff, and how could they think? Well, you know, let's let's be be charitable, and we we have to be open to that, and that's really no way to approach um, anybody, our colleagues or the faculty we're working with, to say, oh, everything you know is wrong. Um, but yes, there there are some interesting lingering ideas. Fascinating that you did bring up Myers Briggs. Um, that shows up from time to time, and I'm, you know, that's getting more into personality psychology. But still, mm -hmm. that's one that it it looks good, it feels good. I have a blast every time I take uh, an inventory based on Myers Briggs. But we should not 
really be, you know, leading students to believe that they're getting something special. And we definitely shouldn't invest a lot of time in, you know, developing a technology or a teaching approach that's going to specialize by Myers-Briggs. Um, that said, as, as some of your uh, folks might know, that's another that I, I've blogged on to say, yeah, it's a little bit our fault too in learning science and cognitive science in particular. We need to do more to give people a better framework for personalizing instruction. We do. So um, until that happens, it's going to be hard. Um, I guess if I had to add anything to, to that list, um, I, attention span. This is one that I, I've, mm. I've kind of been kicking around the idea of writing something about this lately, but um, that's another like, okay, you hear this at the cocktail party, but over in attention research, they've got a very different paradigm. And it's not something that's been debunked exactly, not like being a visual learner or My Myers-Briggs, but it's just a concept that does not really of uh, it's not a part of contemporary attention research to to my knowledge and i I've, I've looked around a bit you know definitely send me links if you if you find anything relevant but yeah this idea that okay your span is this and his span is that and that guy back there plays too many video games so here's his attention it, it's attention is very situationally this. driven oh thank you <laughs> i feel encouraged um it's very situationally driven and uh, furthermore, I'm not convinced that there's been a change per se as a function of technology. I mean, if you mm. if you read the popular mm. press, you get this idea of like, okay, here's this egg timer in your brain. And now that you've had a smartphone for five years, your little egg timer is now, you know, turned turned out. Um, I guarantee you there are situations, I don't care how focused you are, where your, your attention is going to be gone in about a minute. And then you can sit through a feature film and be more or less engaged right. for well over an hour. Uh, two hours if it's a Coen Brothers film, but that's just me. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, so we've got that. And I, so we need to get out of that. And I did, there's a great... Um, Actually, a plug for T for Teaching. If you haven't heard the T for Teaching podcast, it's fantastic. Comes out of SUNY Oswego. I tweet their stuff all the time. Anyway, they talked about an, an offshoot of this. It's sort of a factoid that went around almost like an urban, urban legend of the 10-minute rule of student attention. That you have students' attention for 10 minutes and then it's gone at the beginning of class. And, and the person on this podcast, um, I'm, I'm blocking on his name, but he, he actually kind of traced this and where does this come from and is this real and he wasn't a psychologist he i believe he was in a, in stem so it was really neat to hear about that so attention span the 10 minute rule um the idea that technology rots away your attention span in some particular way um we know that games do uh certain kinds of video games do change attention but not in the way you'd expect and not always badly so that's an area where i'd, I'd love to uh to put the word out. Um, yeah, so great question, well, thank thanks. Indeed a great question. And we've uh, we've been covering games yeah, in is. the forum for, for some time. Uh, oh, I think we have uh, oh. Danny, Danny Shepard who wants to join us. Let's see if uh, okay. Danny can. Okay. Uh, this is, I am outflanked now by two psychology professors. <laughs> There's gotta be a word for this. Uh -oh. <laughs> Hello, Professor Shepard. Whoop, can we, can we see and hear her? Hi. I think you're muted, Danny. Yeah. That's why that's why I'm learning about tech. Oh hi. There we go. Perfect. Oh, I think we lost Oops, you again. You're muted again. Hit it one more time. <laughs> yeah, you're muted just a little bit. How about now? Perfect. Yes, gotcha. <laughs> I'm so sorry. This is why I'm taking a webinar on how to it's use technology. <laughs> You're great. Um, so, so yeah, as, with a background in neuroscience and then in psychology, you're just really, really feeding my soul right now. So thank you for being here, Dr. Miller. I really appreciate You're welcome. it. welcome. <laughs> thank you. So, um, thank you as well. You know, Psychologists are always, I'm always like, oh. Yeah. So I was responding to actually, was it Vasu that was that was on and talking about, um, you know, how how do we bridge that gap? And 
uh, it took me this long to be able to find a way to insert myself into that conversation. So it kind of brings us back to um, what he was talking about. But I know that um, I was very involved in uh, International um, Society for the Research on Service Learning. Um, and, mm. and basically, oh, they, had, uh, they, they developed a way of addressing this same question and bridging this gap. And so the organization basically created a library where all of the research across all disciplines come together. They, they basically bring this together into a library. And so having this library where all the research from all the journals that you don't actually um, have, you know, people in individual disciplines mm -hmm. don't necessarily read everything across and even searching for the tags, you know, tags and keywords and, and stuff to find that. Mm -hmm. But it's so nice to be able to just go into the database. They just, they, they basically have a, uh, a staff in a library that just literally their job mm -hmm. is to pull all the research on service learning into one location. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that might be a way to bridge the gap within education is to find uh, a, a platform and location for pulling that uh, library uh, together, wow. or if one even exists, I, or if one even exists, right? So to pull that together, well, we, and, and it wouldn't it be great too? Oh, go ahead, Brian. We kind of have one. Um, this is okay. the uh, from Oregon State University. Uh, Katie Lindner uh, has uh, produced mm -hmm. one on online uh, digital learning's efficacy. Now, that's for online learning in general, not for service learning, but it is completely multidisciplinary. Um, I can uh, mm -hmm. share the uh, URL in the chat box right now. Uh, we met with her mm -hmm. this March, and it's a fantastic project. Mm -hmm. That's, that's I, awesome. I completely that's, that's exactly agree. That's what, what we need. About. Yeah, and if it, in the case of learning sciences and kind of applied cognitive science, I think any library too, what would be really great specific to that field is if it did identify, you know, what do we kind of know? Like retrieval practice, that's a settled question. It's, it's great and it works. But then there are other things like some of the stuff around attention and um, probably a few others where there is still kind of like on the one hand, on the other hand. So kind of said, all right, what's controversial still and what's non-controversial? So just kind of thinking off the top of my head. That would be great. I mean, I've compiled reading lists and things like that over the years, so I know that there's a, a demand, but that's just going to be idios a little idiosyncratic to me. Um, right. Yeah, so if there was something that were multidisciplinary and broad, um, maybe if it also broke down kind of theoretical stuff versus, okay, here's how it was deployed in botany, here's how it looked in physics, here's how it happened in English, um, and yep. pulled that together. Ooh. <laughs> I, I totally agree. We, we need that. Yeah. And Brian, you and said in learning you were science. Yes, um, we. Uh, I'll email both of you after this, um, and I just put it in the chat box. Cool. Um, but the the key thing is that's um, uh, Danny Lindner was the uh, lead on that. Um, I'm sorry, Katie Lindner. Um, and there's uh, some great stuff there. Yeah. Thank I mean, you. we psychologists, we can't, if we want this stuff to be applied, we have to make it, you know, we have to make it accessible. We have to translate it and we have to advocate for it. We got to evangelize for it. I mean, it is just, I feel very passionately. It's not enough to just, you know, put it in a disciplinary journal for us and just go, well, why doesn't everybody know this? And I, I mean, granted, that's a bit of a caricature, but, but I feel like that's sort of been a, an issue over the years. Like, well, how can you think that learning styles is a thing? Well, you got to do the outreach and you got to, and you got to answer the questions too. You can't just say, well, you know, cause we did the research. Like I said, people across disciplines now are, I'm, it's fabulous. They're really savvy, many of them, about um, qualities of the research that really, you know, they bear on whether they're going to be applicable in a classroom or an online learning situation. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Professor Shepard. And whoever is there with you, hello and thank you too. <laughs> hello. <laughs> We have uh, we have more questions. Uh, I think we have one from Clark okay. coming up. So let's see if we can bring them up on stage. Okay. 
And this is from the clock, Sean Nelson from the University of Maryland. Hi. Hello, Dean Sean Nelson. Oh, maybe maybe they have a connecting issue. Um, yeah. Could be on a mobile phone in a car based on the headset. We'll see if we can make it there. Sometimes I feel like okay. the forum is putting enormous pressure on the entire global network. <laughs> I think my lights are coming down. Oh, yes. The whole city's go dark as a result. Yes. <laughs> we'll give him a try. Give him one more second here. Okay. And uh, and Tara, if, if he's stuck, we'll, we'll turn to a text question because we, uh, we have some of those as well. Uh, this is from Jessica Sullivan, who says, I read in your bio, so this is for you, Michelle, mm. that you have researched decision-making as well as behavioral neuroscience. Could you share more about mm. this question, research of yours, and what are the current questions for new research? Oh, good question. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and I should probably clarify, um, I, I've done some practical work on decision, you know, the decisions that we make in teaching and design of online learning, but I, I would say that primarily most of my uh, cognitive research has not been in, in decision making per se. Um, in behavioral mm. neuroscience, um, that, you know, some of the things that I, I have not gotten involved in this um, extensively with respect to, to learning questions, but uh, back in the day when I was doing my I was able to um, help design functional MRI studies um, and things like that that had to do with working memory mm -hmm. and uh, just some of the ins and outs of, of how that works. And uh, also did a little bit of work in, in uh, ERP the, uh, and EEG, um, but most of that had to do with some uh, pretty involved issues having to do with sentence grammar and how we use working memory during sentence comprehension. That said, it did, I feel, give me a, a good grounding to at least be able to, to dissect and, again, translate some of the work in, in that area. I, I think there do continue to be, outside of education in particular, there do tend to be some misconceptions about what we can and what we can't learn from those different paradigms. Um, you know, the idea that we could just take a snapshot of the brain and see it in action, eh, not Right. Not always. Uh, and it really does depend on how mm. it's designed. So mm. that's how behavioral neuroscience has come in. And um, yeah, so most of my work and most of what I actually think is really relevant to what we're talking about today is mostly the what we would call behavioral uh, research approaches, looking at reaction time, looking at accuracy. Um, I, it's not that I think that neuroscience isn't relevant. I just think that there's a whole lot from more traditional methodologies that are that is very very relevant. So I, I try to be judicious about that. So good question. Really good question. Um, we're we're coming at this uh, topic from a number of different areas, uh, and here's a completely different area. Uh, this is from Liz, okay. uh, Liz Stevenson on Twitter, and she asks. What differences exist for students who have experienced significant trauma, and how can I support okay. their online success? Wow. Okay. And I, here I want to be careful to um, not to kind of overstep into clinical psychology, and um, since that that isn't an area where I can claim expertise. Um, that said, there are. I mean, we know that there are long term issues with, uh, for example, encoding new information. It doesn't mean that, you know, students are not going to mm. be able to do that. And, and there's a lot of individual variability um, that we, we still don't know why different individuals react so differently to trauma than others. Um, I think that I would probably gravitate towards some some of what we're we're looking at in say student persistence and that's just an, that's an area where I, a lot of my administrative work at NAU is in is in student persistence and just this kind of general idea that you know communicating high standards without um, putting students in really anxiety provoking situations I think there's an old school belief in education. You know, look to your left, look to your right. One of you is not going to be here. Uh, you know, let's put pressure on them. Yeah. And I think it, in, in most kind of typical classes that we're teaching, um, I think that we want to kind of err on the side of kind of having students bring their anxiety and arousal levels down, not ramp them up. 
and even things like the wording we use in our syllabus you know you will get this done by sunday night or else that's one thing you can say or, or you can mm -hmm. say in this class we're going to be sure we've engaged in all of our discussions by this time. you know so just really looking at what is the feeling that's being communicated to students um in particular one that's mm. on my mind it's mm. it's a very it's relatively easy to use but boy it really changes your mindset it is wise feedback so the idea that when we give feedback to students we first off say okay what is this feedback about we say yeah, this is a really demanding assignment or what we kind of communicate. Yeah, we have high standards. And then we say, and I believe that you can do it. And here's how. So I've really been trying to do that. And I, it's one of those great teaching approaches that most likely is good for most students. But for particular students, those who are grappling with anxiety, who can't always, you know, instantly rise to an occasion the way um, the rest of the other students might be able to. It's going to be particularly good for them. So I would, I would look at kind of those communication um, aspects of the syllabus and really re-examining some of our assumptions like, does it have to be a timed test? I always assumed that if I, we have a practice low stakes quiz. And now I'm more likely to say, you know what? I don't know what this time limit is doing other than introducing some stress into the equation. So again, as, a, as wow. just speaking kind of frontline faculty member, and not necessarily as, you know, not as a clinical psychologist. That's what I think. What do you think, mm -hmm. Brian? Personally, I'm, I'm biased. Uh, I'm one of those mm -hmm. uh, people who prefers a relaxed and supportive teaching environment. But I know that's not a universal pedagogy. Mm -hmm. um, I did have yeah. a, a, per, a question to follow up on this, if I have the mm -hmm. correct term. Uh, do ACEs play a role in this? Uh, adverse childhood experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I know that there's, I know through my students who've, who've done work on, the, on this and who found that an interesting topic that, yeah, uh, people over in the side of clinical psychology and developmental psychology, they are finding some, um, some pretty striking things about adverse childhood experiences and how those really do um, change individuals. And, you know, I think that, that, yeah, we'll see how that research plays out. And I think there's a lot of room for discussion and debate about, you know, how do we change our teaching as a result? But doesn't it all start with awareness and saying, yeah, the students are mm. individuals, mm -hmm. think differently, they're, these things are coming mm -hmm. across differently. Um, mm -hmm. And so we kind of have to, it, it's ideal if we can be mindful of that. And I think it comes across to students. I think they know online or face-to-face -face, um they can pick up when you have what like that you're saying a relaxed and supportive environment where we're on the same side of the problem in a way we're both on the same side of this ent enterprise instead of the again old school adversarial approach i've got the points you're trying to get them from me and we're gonna you know do this all right. semester and and see what happens so yeah maybe part of a bigger almost mindset shift on our part so i'm glad you brought it up oh it's a great question uh thank you liz um, yeah. and uh, it's a rich answer um, so we're gonna we're gonna try and get clark on here before we run out of time and okay. see if his signal is okay. good enough oh thank you I hi, think my, hi. My, hi hi thanks thanks for thanks for trying again my computer pooped out on me um i was just wondering what a yeah. few top tips you have are um michelle for cognitively op optimizing online courses and especially at the graduate mm. school level but also in relation to mm. MOOCs uh, that we're seeing and how you know how that fits with their predominantly video lecture based content and so on Ooh, okay. So top tips and, uh, you know, big, big picture stuff, especially. So you're saying um, how to bring more of that to MOOCs or you're uh, uh, just, well, I'm just wondering what the, I'm wondering what the top tips are for optimizing online courses and how that meshes yeah. with or against meshes. the predominant um, uh, right. paradigm in most MOOCs. Yep. You kind of nailed it there. Yeah, it, it's true. Um, you know, wasn't it interesting when schools started to say, we're going online and some schools, uh, which I'm not gonna, that meant we're gonna have high production value videos of our professors talking. 
uh, that really said a lot about what they think the instruction is. And, you know, I think a top tip is one that uh, is it's very, very similar to what's going to come through on things like backwards design, defense ideas. Um, back up and say, what do you want them to be able to do? What do you want them to be able to do? And be very cautious about the slideshow aspect of it. I've, I've seen that, too, of we're going online. Here's my PowerPoints. See you later. Um, that slideshows can be great. I use them sometimes in discussion. But again, that's not the heart and soul. Think about what students are doing on the other end of that terminal to uh, that resembles the things that you want them to be able to do at the end of the course. If you want them to be able to apply, uh, say, psychology concepts to their lives, well, then they need to be doing that. Or like I, I designed an online course that was about building memory power. We, we, it was an experimental thing. Um, but they were, I set up slideshows, but there were slideshows where students tried different memory techniques. And then they, they it was using a, something called voice thread. Then they talked mm -hmm. about their actual experience. So it wasn't about let's use a voice thread and have some discussions, discuss and reply to two peers. Is it good? Is it bad? That depends on, you know, what the underlying activity was. So really having that big overarching framework. And, I mean, variety is good, if nothing else, because it forces us to, to think about, okay, is too much going into these discussion forums? Is it all just about watching lectures? Um, I think that's, that's definitely the part of it. And, yeah, MOOCs can be good when you have engaged learners who are working on problems um, and practicing in a discipline and playing off each other. Um, you know, our, our lo local MOOC that, I, that we run here at NAU, it's uh, on, actually on metacognition and attention for students, is very limited what they're reading. And they do, you know, post and reply to a peer, but it's always kicked off by watching a short video or trying an activity. We were adamant that, you know, that's what they need to do. Are they getting a lot of feedback from me? No. We have hundreds and hundreds of students who go through it, and there's not a lot of feedback in that environment. And they're not writing and, you know, doing any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But they are engaging in the things we wanted them to be able to do. So that may not take the form of a bullet list, but um, I think that that's probably the, the best that you can do in terms of how do you get off to the right start when you start designing this course. Because, you know, once we do start going down the road of it's going to be PowerPoints and here's my lectures, uh, then then you kind of settle into that. So backing up, saying from the beginning, what do you want them to be able to do? And high tech, low tech, video, text doesn't matter so much as what are they doing on this side of the, of the experience. So yeah, that was, yeah, that's, that, that's a that's a tough question and a good one. Oh, great question, Clark. Thank you, um, friends. I, I I hate to say it, but we are at the at the end of our hour, um, and uh, and and to to, to bridge out, uh, if I could ask um, uh, Michelle one last question myself, which is, sure, uh, what do you see as the pedagogical affordances based on learning science of video conferencing? Okay. What we're doing now. Oh, <laughs> well, let's see. I think that, you know, um, this, you know, in this interface, you can clearly see we've tried to kind of step back and say, okay, what, what's important about being in a room full of people and, and how do we uh, replicate that in, in an environment? Um, so, you know, a lot of it, too, comes down to uh, can we do synchronous versus asynchronous things? And we saw how a lot of prep time can go into that. But when it happens, it can definitely be pretty powerful. So in as much as it makes us step back and say, all right, why am I assuming that being in a room with me for an hour and 15 minutes is going to promote learning? What is it about that? If it makes us kind of zero in on that experience and say, what can we replicate in an environment and key to a lot of online teaching, how can we go do it one better? Because there's probably some things that are better about video conferencing than milling around in, uh, in a face-to-face -face environment. And I will let everybody else think about what those over and above affordances might be. Thank you. That's a good project. That's good homework. <laughs> good homework. Um, Mich Michelle, thank you so much for being here. We, we are out of time, but you've Thanks been a fantastic me. guest. Um, where Thanks. can people find you? Um, your blog is uh, michellemillerphd.com slash blog. 
Yes, yeah. So my blog um, is is a great place, um, and uh, it's got a, a you know typical contact email address as well. Um, and that's that's probably a good place. I'm also on academia.edu, and that is a good place to find uh, links to publications and, and things like that that I may have written. And Twitter. Um, I, I'm on Twitter pretty much every day, and I, I really love retweeting and finding, you know, different pieces and things I hadn't read yet and, and good stuff there. So, yeah, help me out on Excellent. Twitter. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, and we look forward to your thank new you. book on uh, your new book on the tension span and why everything you know about it is wrong well very good <laughs> let me let me start calling <laughs> thank you Excellent. so much I'll what a wonderful it. group we have here indeed thank you so much um friends i uh, really appreciate your huge range of questions today everything from the details of pedagogy to the changes of the history of disciplines it's fantastic and if you'd like to uh, find the, her book, uh, Minds Online, there's a widget right down here uh, on the left side. Um, now, next week, uh, we're going to shift ground and return to the topic of government policy, uh, technology, and education. We're lucky to have Jared Cummings back from uh, Educoms, who will help us understand what's going on net neutrality and other policies. This is a great topic, a vital one, an emerging one, and he's a great guy to this. Now... Just to hurry up before we have to go, um, we are still getting ready to plan our next book club reading, so any suggestions are welcome. If you'd like to find out more about the book club uh, or buy the books, go to the book store online. If you'd like to keep up with us on social media, we have all kinds of connections. We have discussion groups on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Slack. We're grateful for all your conversation, grateful for all the discussions, and we look forward to seeing you online and right back here next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>